Okay, so I think we'll get uh, started today. Um, so welcome back everybody uh, to the fourth week of our course. Wow, it's really going by fast. Um, we hope you're, you're enjoying it so far. Um, so today we're going to be speaking with you um, about grief and loss. So I want to start today um, by acknowledging that I'm joining you on lands that have been occupied by First Nations for millennia, lands rich in civilizations. Um, and as an uninvited guest on this land, I have the pleasure of living, working, and playing on this beautiful territory. And I'm thankful for the Mississauga people who have cared for and continue to care for these lands. And we honor their long history and commitment um, to this beautiful territory. Um, and we uphold and uplift the voices and values of their people. So as part of that, we respect and affirm the inherent treaty rights of all indigenous people across this land and continue to honor the commitments to self-determination and sovereignty that we've made to indigenous nations and people. All settlers, um, including those who have recently arrived, um, have a responsibility to consider what it means to acknowledge the history and legacy of colonialism. So today I really invite us all to think and reflect um, on a few questions. How does this land acknowledgement relate to the work you are doing um, or the place where you live? And what is the history of the territory you live in? Um, and what is the impact of colonialism there? And then to think about what is your relationship with the territory? How did you come to be there? And then I think finally thinking about how can we develop relationships with people whose territory we are living on? So just some thoughts for us to consider um, in today's land acknowledgement, thank you. Okay, so um, today we're going to be speaking with you about grief and loss. So we're going to be talking a bit about the impact of grief and loss on your loved one during COVID. And we're also going to be sharing um, some resources, some stories, um, and some strategies around how to support your loved one and um, coping with grief and loss. Um, so today, uh, Yona and Lee will be speaking with you, um, as well as Amy. Um, so we're really looking forward uh, to, to our sharing and our teaching today. So we thought we'd start um, today with a question. So this is our first um, Slido poll. So our question is, which losses have impacted your family during COVID? So lots of people, loss of routine and activities. And it looks like next, inability to see family and friends. I imagine, sorry about that, the ability not to select more than one, because I'm sure for many of you, it's been more than one of these losses that your family um, has been impacted um, by. I think we can, um, we can take the poll down and we will, um, I will pass it over to Yona um, to get us started. Thanks, Joanna. <clears throat> this is always a hard session. And I think um, I have to say as, as COVID continues, I think the session becomes more and more relevant. And I actually wish this was a session we talked about even without COVID, because I think one of the difficulties around the experience of grief is that it's just something we don't talk about for people with developmental disabilities. And it's the one thing actually, it's something we all have in common. You know, we all have lost someone that we love. We've all have lost experiences that we treasure that we can't have, uh, and we all will lose people. Right, so it's something that we have in common with the with the people that we love. So this slide is just showing all the different ways that grief um, impacts us. It's not just an emotional experience; it also can affect us um, cognitively. So we can be more absent-minded or confused, and so can our loved ones. It also can lead to real, actual, physical, like body type difficulties, particularly around appetite and sleep, or pain, and uh, and our behavior. Right, and I think in mind some people in this group probably have actually um, lost a loved one uh, like as in death that kind of lost since COVID began but even if you think about for example if someone can no longer see somebody that they really love because of lockdown 
because of rules or because they live in a home, for example, that's not with family and it's staffed and there's no visits allowed, the experience there might be the very same experience as they would be having if that person actually died. So we can grieve about things we've lost, whether it's an actual death or just a real sort of missing out and missing or longing kind of experience. I've got three pointers here, and I'm actually going to talk about a couple more pointers <coughs> as well. There's no right way to do this, um, but I think what we have learned over time in research studying grief in this population, and again, when I say grief, big grief, so not just grief due to death, but just grief due to loss, is that it is really important to acknowledge it uh, and give people like a language to use, right? That helps them understand what it is that they're experiencing. So I think sometimes we have this, uh, uh, sometimes we kind of like try to, you know, well, you're not happy. Let's be, ha let's be happy. You're not sad. You're happy, right? So we're kind of trying to cheer people up, but at the same time, we're kind of invalidating what they actually are experiencing. And it, it might work. Uh, sometimes, you know, we can get people to snap the things, but it's actually really important to have space for people to be able to recognize what it is that they are feeling. And even to understand that other people feel those same things, right? Um, so I think we have to watch out for kind of trying to get people out of uh, their grief moment, um, that it really does make a difference sometimes just for all of us to feel heard. And that includes people with developmental disabilities. And then finding, you know, in terms of the way people express their sadness or their frustration, you know, help them find ways that are, um, I guess most adaptive, right? So not harmful, but ways that they can express those feelings. Uh, and eventually with time, you know, grief can uh, can lessen in terms of the impact that it has. So we can comfort people and we can also learn to comfort ourselves. Uh, and it's also really important connecting with their circle of support that they're not alone with their grief and we are not alone, just us and them uh, with their grief. So there's a broader group of people we can reach out to. and. I'm seeing people um, popping up some messages in the chat box who've had dealt with grief. You know, sometimes we actually really do need to reach other people. And in my own life with my own sister, I have uh, another sister who died. Um, and I have to say that for the experience of my parents and, and even for me, like, we had to think about how we could support my sister who didn't die with a disability during grief, recognizing that there were certain things we could do and certain things maybe we couldn't do. And it was really important to kind of say to those other people who want to support us and who want to potentially support my sister, this is going to be helpful right now, right? She could use this right now. And it's actually really hard for me to do it right now. So looking at that circle of other people to help them appreciate the experience of grief and to share that, that process, being able to comfort people so it's not all on you and it's not all on that person. I think tangible ways we can help people um, manage with grief and loss. Yes, thanks, Yona. Um, so this slide is just ways to prepare for uh, and support our loved one um, as they, if, you know, we've all lost contact uh, in the ways we usually meet and be with people. So um, some of these suggestions I'm sure you've tried over the almost year that we've been in COVID, um, you know, so holding a shared object, you know, just reading those through having social stories. We were trying virtual distant visits and um, for myself, I know that I reached out to friends just asking for them to check in with my son more often um, because then there were more people calling him and he felt more connected. But I guess what this really did also is highlight to me just how small um, my son's circle actually is. And, um, and how many are people are paid workers. So this was just an, an invitation for me to expand the circle uh, and ask for more people to be in our lives. Um, and I think one of the biggest things I've been learning is just the importance of just listening, what Yona said, just listening and not trying to give advice, but just to acknowledge feelings, just coming alongside and listening for however that's expressed and making space. And sometimes I think I, I really just tried to, you know, say things that I thought might be helpful to cheer my son up, but actually I'm finding it's just sometimes more helpful just to acknowledge that I understand and, and that piece of just not trying to skip over grief. So um, 
there's ways also that, you know, we've been working really hard on all of us to supporting the loss of routine and, and programs. And, you know, we all need to do something that we feel is meaningful. So thinking about what is meaningful for our loved one and sort of revisiting and brainstorming new ways that that can be meaningful at this time. So I really liked a quote I heard recently of thinking of myself more as a roommate to my son versus the traditional mother son relationship. And what would I expect from like a roommate? So that's really helped me think about sort of, you know, what is a contributing thing that he can do around the home? Like, you know, being just instead of thinking of it as increasing his skills, but it's also just changed the paradigm of how we were sort of interacting with each other. And then also just, you know, what about, um, you know, things we could do within our community. So, you know, we, we baked a bunch of cookies and handed them to some of our neighbors and, uh, you know, another friend uh, that I have whose son is very strong, you know, volunteered to do snow shoveling um, or picking up items for neighbors from the store. Um, that, that these are things I've just been finding have been helpful and fairly easy to, to do really. Um, and then movement, and as we heard from um, Natasha last week, that 30 minutes of vigorous exercise three times a week was equivalent to antidepressants. So that idea of just getting outside, for me, just it changes the view. It, it, it expands how I think when I'm out outside hearing the birds. And I, I really notice the same for my loved one, just being out in the fresh air, getting some physical exercise. So these are things you you've all been doing, I know. Um, but I really like these booklets um, that we've been referring to. Also, uh, this um, sorted out is a section of the booklet. And I just, um, I really like it. It's a way to help you solve, you know, kind of brainstorm together. And it gives examples of problems. Um, you know, if I'm, what to do if I'm bored or worried or lonely. Um, and uh, and they, they, they break it down into these five steps. Um, you know, to name what the problem is, to brainstorm solutions, to focus on one particular idea you might have, and then give it a go and see what happens, which like sort of gives permission to make a mistake and try something new. So I really like, I really like uh, that section sorted out. Um, and then the, you can do it was just really helped me think about all the benefits. We, we, my son and I talked about like all the benefits we're finding if he stays active and how to how can we continue to be active during this time? So I think you'll really like those resources. So you can um, maybe uh, hear a little bit of a catch in my throat as I'm talking about it today because this is a really important time uh, to think about and talk about and make room for grief. And this, as Jonas said, this isn't just about grief of having someone die. There's there's um, a lot of grief going on. So I just, I wrote some notes about that to prepare for today. And, and I, I heard this one podcast that a couple of podcasts I've been listening to. Um, and this Dr. Egar who went through, you know, I hope I'm saying her name right, but she was an Auschwitz survivor. And she just said, you cannot grieve what you do not feel. And I just thought that was just such a powerful sentence that to give myself permission to grieve and to give our loved ones permission to grieve. And, and I guess grief and loss has just been more real to me over the past year. And they've been a close companion. And I think for many reasons, I've, I've kind of wanted to learn from them instead of pushing them away or, or, or thinking that I'll deal with them another day, which maybe is what I did before COVID. And, uh, and so instead I've been reading more books and listening to podcasts to help me understand more and to better support myself and in turn then support my loved ones. Because in addition to the sort of the personal loss, I'm, I'm unable to visit my elderly mother who's 93 and my sister who's quite sick in Kelowna. I, I haven't been able to go visit them like I usually do. And that's made me sad, like um, obviously, but I feel also like just that we're all going through a collective grief. Um, and an uncertainty of like what life is going to be like after COVID ends, what's it going to look like? And um, and there's been a lot of losses this past year for, for many of us. There's loss of life and loss of jobs and 
loss of being connected, loss of freedom with the wearing masks, and, and there's just been so many others. So as caregivers, I just was thinking how we're so used to fixing things or advocating for change and getting, you know, making things better. But so much of this past year, we couldn't fix. And that's been humbling. Um, but in some ways, it's helping me to sort of prioritize as to what's really important and how do I want to be and what actions and words and thoughts do I want to focus on? Um, because life seems just more precious and fragile than ever now. And, um, you know, uh, I, so that, that's just some of the, the things that I've been thinking about and, and, and just the, giving myself permission to feel that grief because, uh, you know, just sometimes I think recognizing that it's not just this moment that we're grieving either. There's, you know, we talked about that lived experience in the help model and how we're often feeling grief about one thing, but it's a cascading effect. And that's the same for our loved one. It's not just this moment. It maybe is a whole bunch of moments that have not been expressed or they come up, uh, uh, you know, sort of fresh and, and new. Um, so it seems sort of counterintuitive, but rather than my instinctual reaction to, to run in the opposite direction, I, I just realized through this time that I can't escape suffering and to actually move towards what hurts instead of away has actually been very, very helpful. And just the last thing I wanted to say is not to compare my feelings uh, with what others are going through. Sometimes it's like I say to myself, well, I, I've got so much to be grateful for. I, you know, at least my mom is still alive and I could talk to her on the phone. But, but that sort of comparison grief as if, you know, I guess this one podcast really said to me that the worst loss is always your own loss. And so, you know, it isn't a, a matter of saying, well, my loss isn't as great as somebody else's. Loss is loss. And I think um, it just seemed important for me to just talk to you as fellow care caregivers to just pause a moment and, you know, to say just to make room for our own grief. And, and then as I model those ways that I expand the ability to hold my own grief, then I'm able to make room for my son and my other loved one's grief. I can't give away what I don't give to myself. So I, I hope that's helpful, what I mean by uh, about making room for grief. So we're going to just go into a breakout room and we're going to just ask, you know, what else have you found helpful or unhelpful in supporting the loss and grief of your loved one? So thank you very much for, I'm sure what you had was very fulfilling conversation about grief and loss. And um, if you would, if you want to take a moment and, and do as some of you are doing, just writing in the chat function, some of the helpful and unhelpful ways that you've been um, dealing with these losses. So thank you, listening, group nine sharing, you know, um, in any format is helpful. And because through that listening, it allows us to know how to offer those additional supports, absolutely. And keeping routines, taking it day by day. So we'll collect up these really, you know, pieces of wisdom from you. So I like this, I wanted to share this uh, beautiful um, resource for you. And again, all of these will be listed uh, on our summary page and on our web page or website for you to look into it more detail. But um, this doctor, I don't know how to, I hope I don't say her name wrong. Yona Tafri Wynn, is it? Um, has created these most beautiful guidelines to help us in, to uh, speak to our loved ones ab about death, dying, and other losses. And they're, they're really wonderful. She's such a beautiful person. You can just tell that by listening to her. Um, she, there's a, a lovely video of her speaking about it too. 
Um, and just a couple of things that I wrote down from um, watching these is, you know, don't avoid the issue of, of, of grief and, and, and loss. Um, anticipate questions, but also lack of questions. Be honest and admit you don't know. And allow feelings of sadness, as we said, including your own. I like that she said, don't overdo it. You don't talk for too long. Um, or, and, but don't make the assumption either that how much is being understood. Um, and respect the need that maybe that's enough for one day, or even that denial is a coping mechanism. And to repeat the information at different times and in different ways. And to get expert advice if you need to. So those are some of the, the, the points that I uh, took from this really wonderful resource. And Amy, I wondered if you would uh, share your experience. Yeah, I just want to share my experience of um, our, of death and, and my daughter. So my daughter is, is 28. And um, over the years, our, our family's experienced death of grandparents and friends. And we've always brought our daughter with us to do the visitation and to the shiva and to the funeral. So lots of experience with death. And um, finding now things are, are so different because we've gone online. So several months ago, there was someone we knew their parent and we went to an online burial and we went to an online funeral. So have, have other people experienced that yet at this point? I think a lot of people have. Yeah, at the time that was considered unusual. And I think what was, was nice for my daughter was that she could, she could come and go. Um, but I'm finding now um, we've, it, there's been a lot of death um, it's becoming more and more common. And of course, people are also dying of other things. And so um, two children were killed in a car accident on our street and another man, and there's just a lot going on. And I think what I'm finding really challenging is these remote experiences don't seem to be holding my daughter anymore. That's not something she's showing interest in because everything seems to be online. So so how do you do that? And, and she's she recently heard about a death of a pair a peer and she read about it on Facebook. So we've um, we're actually going to attend a, a remote funeral for this person on Friday. So I, I'm finding it really, really difficult and, and trying to follow her lead. She's not a person who would have a lot of language or a lot of questions, although she's quite computer literate. But I, I think what I'm what we're trying to do is um, again routine, um, do things like cook together, something where we're beside each other so those we can just be together, um, go out in nature, feeding the birds, just going out and and doing things and being there and trying to connect to to real life rather than so much of this remote and online. And also you were mentioning Lee the idea of um, Roommates, um, for my daughter, there's a lot of meaning in um, helping. So she's doing my laundry, she's taking out the garbage, all those things. So just finding ways, again, to connect. Um, and I guess the other thing to, to remember, we talk a lot about self-care. So this, this is very difficult. It's um, difficult on them. It's difficult on us taking this all in collectively. So whatever we can do. Um, yesterday, I sat down and downloaded a whole bunch of wonderful books from the library, which is something for me that feels really good. So I don't have a lot of answers, but I'm just finding it seems to be building and these online ceremonies are, are there. There's what we can do right now, but it really it muddies how people can express grief and, and be part of be together. Thanks so much, Amy. Yona, I think you're going to do the next slide. Thank you, uh, Lee and Amy. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about some resources, uh, and then I'll probably forget what I was supposed to say, and I'll make up something else instead. Equally as good. Um, so, Lee mentioned Irene, and there's a beautiful smile in the corner of this slide where it says, "Let's talk about bad news: death and dying coronavirus." That was a webinar uh, that she had organized and put on earlier in the pandemic, uh, and we'll share the link for that. Although, if we are talking about death, there was a beautiful webinar. Um, that took place um, about a week and a half ago. And I'm going to put the link into that one because um, Irene speaks, a number of um, people with developmental disabilities speak about their experience. And also a mother who I completely adore, 
who is also a Baroness in the House of Lords, Dr. Sheila Hollins, um, speaks in this video. And she was actually one of the first people to study the experience of bereavement and grief in people with developmental disabilities. And she offers some really beautiful advice. And of course, she does it with her amazing British accent, which makes it all the better. Um, so I would really encourage you to watch um, that video. It's about uh, less than an hour in length in total and just so rich with experiences from many perspectives around how people deal with grief. So a few video links. And then the other two resources I mentioned on this slide, in the left corner, it says talking end of life with people with intellectual disability. And this is a rich resource that was developed in Australia. Again, around this issue of how people with disabilities cope with grief. Um, and the, the lesson from all these different studies is that people do feel grief, whether they can express it or not. And people do appreciate being spoken to about grief, you know, whether it's about the loss of someone uh, that they love or just the experience of the fact that things died, you know, animals die, plants die, people die. We hear in the news about people dying all the time. So even if it's no one, you know, anyone who walks by a television, you know, hears about deaths right now. So it's helpful for people to be thinking about death and what that means. Um, and then this bottom resource is a beautiful resource that's free. And we'll send you the link as well. So we've talked a bit about books beyond words in this course. Um, you can download books beyond words as a kind of app on your tablet or computer or whatever, or you can order some of these books or you can just print this resource guide. Um, but it was put together earlier in the pandemic. So if someone did actually die from COVID to sort of explain what was that about uh, with a few tips um, and discussion points in it. So lots of really nice resources. Um, I'm going to look at the next slide and then that will remind me if I want to talk about the other stuff that I forgot to put in the slide. So, um, one comment I just want to say about grief, because I don't remember if it's in the slides or not, is that it is a process. Okay. So, like, I know, for example, that someone I love died, and I even know that today I'm going to the funeral and I'm going to bury the person that I love. But, you know, when I wake up this morning, I don't actually remember that they're dead. Right? And it's not until I see the actual funeral or I'm involved in actually putting the dirt on the coffin that I realize I'm burying the person I love. You know, and then I'm preparing food the next day and I'm thinking about how we're both going to enjoy it because we love this meal because I've forgotten that they're not alive. Right? So how we sort of all process death takes time and changes over time. So keep that in mind when your loved one may seem like they don't really understand or haven't come to terms with this idea that somebody has died that none of us do in a sort of concrete way, right? That it's sort of this ebb and flow in terms of what we remember and what we think about. And that's actually something we all share. Um, and that um, people do notice over time when their loved one is not there. They may not understand time and they may understand that death is permanent as opposed to just someone being absent, but everybody understands this experience of loss. Um, so these are some strategies um, that just highlight different things people might try to do that could be really helpful now. So having that memory book that way of, and I was mentioning in my small group with my own sister, um, trying to take the experience of death and have it kind of as a bit of a story um, for someone that we lost in our family, but also putting in that same book or social story, the special things we missed and we loved about that person. So it still allows her or anybody to talk about the person they miss that they love but in a way that helps them think about the memories that are so wonderful about that person. So they still get to experience the sadness and the loss, but they also get to have that space to remember the person they really miss. And I think that's really important. So memory books can be very helpful and very concrete because the pictures of activities help people remember the kinds of things that they did together. A garden or a place in a house that you create where some of these memories go or a box, anything you can think of can be really helpful. One of the pieces of advice from Baroness Hollins, who I mentioned, who did this video, is that what the memorabilia are that go into that garden or that box, people choose what they choose, right? It's not our place to judge and say, well, that's the wrong thing to put in there to remember that, right? So allow it to be sort of idiosyncratic fitting with that person. Having a playlist or music that we used to love to sing together or listen to together that reminds you of that person could be very helpful. Writing a story or a poem together thinking about delicious food, it was food you enjoyed together and eating that food together, being able to have times where you can have those memories and reminisce with people, going to a space, and this is really hard again with virtual funerals, right, is we don't have, we weren't at the hospital when someone was sick, 
we weren't at the cemetery when there was a when there was a burial right we didn't all gather together in a place but making sure that we can go to those places at some point does help and allowing or following someone if they're searching for the person they're missing and they're loving joining them on that journey to go to those places wherever those places are sort of metaphorically but also literally sometimes can be really helpful and keeping in mind these visuals matter even if the person's not ready to look at the visual now, it may be something that's useful for later. So this may sound a bit morbid, but it can be helpful if someone is in the hospital um, and they die and the person isn't there and they don't see it. It may be helpful for someone to have a picture of that because that explains what happened to the person, right? Or if they weren't at the funeral, having a picture of the funeral and maybe remembering. So I think again, and we talked about this in our small group, I think you know best what your loved one can handle day to day. And maybe today isn't the day to look at that picture, but having those concrete ways of understanding rituals, even if it's something you look at a later day, can be very helpful. Um, and then using the experiences of other people's deaths and other experiences, even though they're less close to you, can still be a way to kind of relate or understand or put into context something that has happened uh, closer to home. Thanks so much for that, uh, Yona, um, and also Lee and Amy for for your really personal um, and really wonderful sharing. Um, I think we can all um, probably relate very much to today's topic. Um, and while I think it's a really hard and um, difficult one, I think it's, um, I'm really glad we're speaking about it today. Um, so we, we thought um, um, we'd sort of pose this question um, and to think about um, a little bit around while it's, important to acknowledge the losses that we've endured um, during COVID, before COVID, um, and that we continue to endure. Um, but to think about some of the silver linings or lessons um, that we can take forward. Um, so we just wanted you to take a moment and think about that. Um, and if you have um, things you want to share, if you could put them in the chat. Um, I know for me, I think I've probably learned a bit more about my own resilience uh, during this time. Um, I think I've spent a lot more time outdoors than I ever did before. Um, it's allowed me to think a little more creatively about my work. Um, I've had more time with the family that I live with, for sure. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to just take a moment and think about this. And if you, if you want to share it in the chat, um, that would be great. But if you just want to have a moment to think about some of the silver linings or lessons that you think you might take forward um, with you. Um, my family and I have been Zooming more because of my mom. It's a great way to talk and share stories. Yeah, I think we've, I don't know, I think probably most of us have become a lot more tech savvy and found ways to connect with people virtually much more than we did before. Um, we learn gratitude and compassionate, compassion in a visceral way. My sister has more resilience with her than I realized. Joanna, okay. I was, yeah, I was, mm -hmm. I was just saying in our small group um, that you know I think before COVID, I, and whenever my well not before COVID now during COVID that whenever I, I just wanted to not deal with my son's grief because I was holding too much of my own, and so I just always wanted to just jump to solutions. You know, let's try this. You could try that. You should feel, you know, it's not, I was, you know, doing all that comparison. Well, like, you're still healthy. Like, you know, let's go for a walk. I was always, I was trying to circumvent his feelings because it just seemed too much to hold my own sadness and try to hold his sadness. So I, I wasn't allowing any space for his feelings. I just wanted to just jump to, to doing what I have done as a caregiver. Like, how can I fix this? And, th and that's one thing that this uh, time has really taught me. You don't fix grief, you come alongside it. And when I allowed space for my own sadness, then I could hold more space for Eric's sadness. But I, I, I just could, it's taken me a whole year to figure that out, that sometimes the best solution was just coming alongside and saying, yeah, this is really hard, isn't it? Or You're really, that's really sad, isn't it? Just acknowledging that this is something we're all doing and um, and going through, but 
I really had to allow space for myself to feel how sad I feel, how much I, I was, I was like being like a beach ball, trying to hold it underwater. And it was like flying out sideways, trying to hold those emotions down. And a commercial on TV would burst me into tears because I wasn't taking the space just to actually have a good cry and say, I'm sad and I'm, there's some things I'm really feeling here. So that's just one thing I wanted to share. It's not necessarily doing anything special except just coming alongside and making space after I've made space for myself. Thanks for that. I know one thing, there's so many beautiful comments in here, which we'll try to summarize and capture for everyone. Um, I think this issue around sort of what you have space for, Lee, and this idea that it's really hard for you sometimes to hold on to your loved one's grief because of your own grief, but that the more you actually just kind of allow that to be there, that space kind of opens up a bit more. It's a really powerful um, description, I think, of what, what does happen. A lot of people, I think, kind of uh, ask sometimes, like, if I, who's the right person to talk to my loved one? Right? Like, what's the right time and who's the right person? What do they need to know and do? You know? And uh, I tell people, you know, whoever it is, they're probably not going to get it right. Like, if you think about your own experiences and all the discussions you've had with people, they probably don't all go perfectly when it comes to grief. We all slip up and say things that upset people that we didn't realize would upset them. We all remember sometimes certain things that <laughs> people said that hit us in the wrong way. So I think a lot of uh, self-forgiveness that we might not get it right is really important. Um, but I would say one thing that does seem to make a difference is having it, you know, if you know, I cannot manage this conversation, right? I'm, I'm full, right? I cannot, I cannot hear this right now. It is too hard for me at this moment. That's a really good time to see if there's someone else who can also be there because your loved one wants to be listened, right? So who else is a listener? And they don't have to be really good at it. They just have to be really good at being with people who are not happy, right? Like some of us are so uncomfortable when people around us are unhappy. We just want to, we want to fix them. That's what you talked about, Lee, right? So the person who might be really good at being with your loved one might be someone who actually is going to be okay if things aren't okay, right? Now, the interesting thing is that just by being with that person might actually make your loved one feel okay, right? Like we have all these great setups sometimes for you know, someone who's grieving to be with someone who's going to be really good at managing grieving, and then the person doesn't seem to be grieving at all. And that's okay, right? But having that ability to hold that space is probably more important than having a specific skill set, right? And, and knowing, again, how to turn, like some people can kind of get really stuck on the part that's so upsetting. So knowing how to sort of be with this upset and help it move a little bit, not to make them not upset, but seeing maybe the part of it that's underneath, like they're remembering this thing because it's something they really miss. It's something they love. Let's talk about that thing you love and you miss. What is so lovely about that? Help me understand that experience, right? Which is different than just sort of focusing again on grief, grief, grief. So we can kind of help grief move for people. I think that's another, another good um, skill. And also remembering, uh, and you'll see this in the video that I put in my link, uh, when the people with intellectual disabilities were talking about their grief is they don't necessarily look sad, you know, but that doesn't mean they're not grieving. You know, I might choose to show my grief by laughing at a lot of stuff, right? Or I might choose to show my grief by talking about something that's really interesting to me right now, really loudly, right? But there's no one way to express grief for us and for our loved ones. And so making sure, again, the people who are helping to support our loved ones in their grief have that recognition or understanding of the many ways we can show things, you know, and, and just keeping that door open, I think, is really critical. Thanks so much, Yona and, and Lee, for that. So we just had one more thing we, we, we wanted you to think about um, before we, we finish our session today. Oh, sorry. Um, maybe we don't have a slide for this, but we, we just wanted you to sort of think about um, or write down one thing um, that maybe surprised you or resonated with you about today's session. Um, and you can put it in the chat if you want, or you can just think about it yourself, um, or write it on a piece of paper you might have nearby. Um, and it might be something um, as simple as having a conversation with your loved one or listening um, to them talk to you about their experience of loss or grief. Um, it might be visiting some of the resources 
we shared today, which we'll, we will be sure to send to you. Um, or it might be to try one of the things that you put in the chat um, that you found helpful because people have shared some really incredible things um, in there. Um, and we will be sure to bring all that information together. Um, so thank you uh, very much to, to Lee and to Yona and to Amy for, for sharing um, that really helpful information and strategies around grief and loss, but also for sharing your, your very personal um, um, and beautiful stories. Um, I think that was really, really lovely and, and very helpful for people. Um, and thank you uh, to everybody for joining us again today, for interacting with us, for answering questions and putting your thoughts and ideas into the chat. And I think we just wanted to share something really quick before we before we disperse. Yeah, you know, I I was just doing so much research on on grief and and uh, I guess because I'm struggling with missing my mom and my sister especially and and er holding Eric's grief. But this one hospice worker said something in a book that I'm reading right now, and it just really struck me. And it's just one quick sentence. He said, "In the end, people who are dying really want to know just two things." Was I, was I loved and was I loving? And I just thought that's such a beautiful summation of maybe where we can come from. Was I loved and was I loving? That's all people really want to know at the end of their lives. So I thought that was just something I forgot to share <laughs> earlier, but it was really meaningful to me. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lee. Okay, thank you very much everybody. We'll we'll see you next week.